Welcome to the Shabby Detective, yet another Columbo podcast. I'm your host, Mike White. Joining me, of course, is the undercover sleuth himself, Mr. Chris Stashu. Bonnie. Oh, wait. Wrong show. Wrong show. Right after. Second time Wrong around show. for Mr. James Gregory. Let's let's hear from Mr. James Gregory, everybody. I think this is his last appearance on Columbo. I think we need to give a Luger alert in this show, in this moment. It's Luger. 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 Luger is here. We are here to talk about Columbo. You are here to listen to us talk about Columbo as we talk about the third episode of the second season of the most crucial game. It's not chess, it's football. This one directed by Jeremy Kagan, written by John T. Dugan, starring Robert Culp. He's back and he's bad. He's really mad. We also have uh, Dean Stockwell in here as the victim. This episode dropped on November 5th, 1972 blissful 70 minutes long we are not padding things out at all with this one this is very tight let's get going here and we've got the return of the one and only val avery who we saw as the guy who was renting boats in kind of ironic i think it was also john dugan that wrote the um uh, dead weight episode and that was the first time we saw Val Avery. This time he's back as a private detective, but we're going to see a lot of Val Avery as we go along here. Great, great face. And you notice he's just hanging out with Peter Falk like crazy. I have a feeling that these guys were really good friends. And what an episode, huh? I want to hear your thoughts about this one because I, I've read the books. They're kind of all over the place as far as, is this a good episode or not? I want to hear what Chris Dashu thinks of the most crucial game. I like that Columbo knew that there was fresh water in the pool immediately. That moment is just, okay, 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 okay. I, hey, look, look, the last episode, The Greenhouse Jungle, we had a lot of quibbles with it, namely... Ray Meland just being at one note, one level the entire time. I mean, Robert Culp is kind of at one level the entire time <laughs> in this episode, and in a, but in a kind of endearing way, because Robert Culp just plays an asshole so well. Chris, why did Robert Culp kill Dean Stockwell? Because he got in his way, man. <laughs> I guess. Like, is that right? Dean Stockwell owns the team, and so Robert Culp wants to own the team that Dean Stockwell owns, so he kills him, but 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 that's not how that works. You don't like yeah, this isn't like that fucking Prince Charles and fucking any of that. Like, oh, Prince Harry would become the king if Prince or if King King Charles now died. Like, that's not how this works. If if Dean Stockwell died, it would probably get auctioned up. And I I don't think Paul Anlin has enough money to scrape together to buy the team. So He's killing Dean Stockwell to kill him. <laughs> to kill him. Like he just wants to kill, to kill him. him. I guess. I think yeah. Dean Stockwell is playing a pretty generic asshole rich person, but he's an asshole who owns a sports team. Why is being the general manager not good enough? I guess that's the question that you're asking. I can tell why he wouldn't like Dean Stockwell, who's this kind of like layabout. There's this thing about, hey, Eric Wagner, I'm busting my ass to go talk with this hockey team and do all these things for you because it was your father's dream to have this huge sports franchise. It's not Eric Wagner's dream. It was Father Wagner, Pear Wagner, that had this dream. And Eric Wagner, he's just fine living off of all of this money, drinking cheating on his wife all this stuff and yeah robert culp it's not like eric wagner is calling up paul hanlon and saying you're doing a horrible job with this team and i'm going to fire you i mean that's that's paul hanlon calling up coach rizzo saying what are you doing you're playing the wrong people blah 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 i'm the general manager i know everything better than you and i know that that phone call at the beginning is to set up the alibi. I know that that is him saying, you suck and I need to see you at halftime and you better come up here so that way you know you've seen me at halftime. There's no way I could have left this game 
gone over to Eric's house and murdered him with a piece of ice in a pool, which I think is a great way of killing this guy. It's just the rest of it doesn't really hold together for me. Oh, is there a Clint Eastwood movie where the assassin is using an ice bullet? Isn't that a thing? Well, I know in Three Days of the Condor, for sure, there's an ice bullet, but I'm not sure about any Clint Eastwood films. I'm a huge fan of ice bullets and ice knives and, oh, we used the th- it, it melted. The weapon is gone. Like, I love that. But yeah, everything else about this episode just smacks of someone who doesn't understand the base idea of what's going on here. You can't murder someone and get their belongings legally. <laughs> I don't think anybody doesn't understand that. And, and it's shocking to me that Someone goes, well, you know, it's a sports team. So, yeah, so it's even more hard to pallet that someone would be able to just get it magically just because. And, I mean, again, okay, so if we take the stumbling block of the premise out, which is, let's just discount the story right at the top, (laughs) which is not a great place to start. At least we have a great performance from Robert Culp. He's great. I really like Dean Jagger in here as well. He is eric wagner's lawyer and what is it he has hired val avery as ralph dobbs to bug these offices he has bugged paul hanlon's phone he's bugged eric wagner's phone and apparently paul hanlon the robert culp character knows that the phone is bugged and he then uses that as also part of his alibi and has this whole labyrinthine thing that he's doing because i think it's him i think it's robert culp who somehow hires eve babcock the valerie harper character to go in and put the bugs no no he has it like he because val avery uses ralph dobbs uses her but somehow she and robert culp know each other because she's a call girl i guess i guess but i don't think they know each other in that professional experience but maybe and also is she actually romanian like <laughs> wait you notice we haven't mentioned peter folk peter folk kind of gets lost in this episode like a little I, bit i don't remember it being a particularly interesting columbo episode of columbo the character but this episode does give us one of the best columbo moments ever hands down full stop you don't mind if I ask you a personal question, do you? No. What'd you pay for those shoes? I think about $60. I stepped into some water yesterday. I ruined mine. You don't know where I could get a pair that looks like that for around 16 or 17. 16 or 17? Sorry, I, I don't really have time. What is the deal with the shoes? I, it was like, I mean, I appreciate a running gag as much as the next guy. Go see our police squad episodes of, of the police squad F as limited series we did. But what was the gag there? Somebody got a wild air up their ass about Columbo asking about shoes. I swear the way that that scene plays out, it almost feels like Peter Falk was just ad libbing. Right. And just like, y- yeah, what's he going to do with Dean Jagger and just walks up. Oh, how much you pay for those shoes? That whole thing of, do you know where I could get a pair for like nineteen twenty dollars <laughs> right. Oh, these are $70 shoes. I get it for like less than 20 bucks. What are you fucking high? <laughs> and that's like the best part of the episode with Columbo. Everything else just I mean, again, look, Robert Culp is such a is such a presence when he's on screen that y- y- you kind of don't want anything else when it's just Robert Culp doing the Robert Culp thing. But yeah, look, it is a Columbo show. It's named after the guy and he's not in the episode as much as he is in other episodes. But you know what? In a lot of ways, that's OK. Because we talked about this on the last episode. In a lot of ways, it's not really Columbo's show. I mean, he's there, but it's the villain's show. It's the murderer's show. It's the criminal's show. Columbo is the antagonist in the show. I think that, if you look at it from that angle, this episode, again, the plot notwithstanding, yeah, Columbo shows up about as many times as he needs to. He's just not particularly memorable, which is a shame. The parlor scene at the end is really good. I mean, it's just basically like there's a few set pieces where it's like, oh, oh, this is really good. Like the whole thing with Valerie Harper. I think that that entire sequence of of scenes is fantastic. I love that. And I love how he introduces himself as Lieutenant Columbo. 
and he scares her John off. And the way, like, yeah, he picks up on her Romanian accent and it's like, okay, yeah, this is interesting. But yeah, I just love that and how she thinks that he's a John, but he's actually there to ask questions. And Valerie Harper, she's just so cute in this episode. And I just, I love her so much and everything. I was a huge Rota fan when I was growing up. And of course, her on Mary Tyler Moore as well. So I, I just have such a, a soft spot for that. And then the old dingling ice cream thing. And every time Columbo talks about dingling ice cream, it's just so freaking funny to me. Hey, that uh, dingling ice cream is pretty good. Like, can we not talk about your dingling, Columbo, for about five seconds? Peter <laughs> Fool's dingling. I do like the image of Robert Culp dressed up as a menacing ice cream man. I With think those that dark glasses. <laughs> yeah, it's in the. <laughs> what are you doing here? Paul, like, well, clearly he's here to fucking murder you because he looks like the killer ice cream. He looks like the ice cream man cometh is what he looks like. <laughs> it's, he's proper. Again, Robert Culp is a proper intense dude. And man, he plays that asshole role just like like it was made for him and nobody else. It's just seething through this whole thing. Columbo, I'm trying to watch this game. What is it? He's so good. I love him in this. Like yes, like you said, it's kind of one note, but I'm okay with that. I mean, because he's just angry all the time. Once Columbo, I'll use the word sneak. He sneaks up on Culp when he's in the phone booth. As soon as that happens, I'm just like, oh yeah, Robert Culp knows that he is fucked right now, and he just he's pretty smooth. And he's just like, oh, I was making a phone call to Montreal. Not that that's any of your business. He is one note, but that really, like, you've kind of mentioned it. Like the one note is just Robert Cole plays it better than anybody else can. Like it's just such an indignant asshole. Just and look, like we talked about it before. It's kind of the haves versus the have-nots in this show, and the have-nots are the ones taken to task. The the haves being terrible, and it's that that's not the case in this episode. Paul Hanlon is a have-not, and he's trying to, you know. Kind of in his in his own twisted way, you know, you know, incur his wrath on the abs of the the Dean Stockwell character, and I, it's like he's like Shadow Columbo. He's so angry and so just menacing, but at the same time, like as someone who busts their ass all the time, like I get it. Like you don't like people that don't pull their fucking weight. But here's the thing: uh, nobody expects the owner of a fucking team to pull their weight. <laughs> like what? Like what the fuck? Like, if Again, they it's just like even um, watch the game. It's amazing. Yeah, exactly. Like I always think about the owner of Manchester City. He fuck. He's a you know the brother of the Saudi Arabian prince, and he's been to one game, and he paid like seven billion dollars for the team. Like, oh, are you gonna complain that he's not doing enough? He's not signing the fucking checks. Like, I I don't I don't understand. Like, I think that the narrative structure is fine. Again, it's very much what we've seen before, but. I just find this particular setup to be lacking to the point of feeling kind of, I don't like to use this word, but it is kind of dumb. Like they missed the, it's it's a general misunderstanding of how these kinds of things even work at a base level. That you just don't kill someone and get their stuff magically. And I it's hard to overlook that. But at the same time, Robert Culp, I think, does enough for me to go, yeah, this is an okay Columbo episodes better than Greenhouse Jungle. That's for sure. Well, it's very interesting that the writer also wrote one of my other least favorites, which is Dead Weight. I have to say, I like this one a lot better than Dead Weight, but you know, it's not it's not a solid episode. There are great little moments, the whole thing with the way that the bugs and the phones interfere with the radio. I mean, you know, I talk about how technology plays such a part of Columbo, and here we have so many things. We've got the whole thing with the radio making a noise when the phone is being used. We've got the tapes and all of this stuff with the tape. And then I like that you have the rhyme of dingling ice cream going with the dingling from the anniversary clock, and that that's the missing piece. And I love when Columbo has that, you know, eureka moment when the cuckoo clock goes off. And I'm just like, yep, you got it. You got it, Columbo. It's not what's there. It's what's missing. And I, I love that so much. It's the whole cart before the horse thing. And I think that it's a shame that that 
twist, the way this is found out, the how catch him. I, I, it's a shame that it's in this episode because it is a really good one and it's a really subtle one. And when you realize where it's going, it's like you said, it's just like, oh man, that's so, so good. Reinforced throughout the episode, the, the jingle and the use of like auditory cues and the, the whole James Gregory thing with the, you know, here's my alibi because it was call me at 530. If you had literally said any other time, you would have been fine. Any other, is it 545? Well, maybe, well, they don't know. I mean, you don't know, but I mean, if you had said any time that maybe that clock's not chiming, you'd be fine. But again, I like that it's just, you know, something you wouldn't necessarily think about. And Columbo being with all those cuckoo clocks, sure, okay, maybe a little heavy handed, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's like beating us over the head with subtlety. The subtlety hammer, folks. <laughs> One goes off, another clock goes off, another, you know, you hear like he, he, he was watching TV, Big Ben is on the TV. <laughs> And, and then you see his eyes turn into clocks. It's like a Joe Dante movie all of a sudden. Like, what <laughs> the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> and you know what? I don't... What? What's the name? What's the title? Oh, what, what is the The title? most crucial game. I know it's what it's that. playing on. Like, is it not playing on the most dangerous game? So there's a an episode coming up about chess. And that is the most dangerous match. So when I read, oh, we're going to be talking about the most crucial game. Oh, fantastic. I love that chess episode. No, no, it's not the chess episode. <laughs> it was not the chess episode. Ooh, no, <laughs> the most crucial game, which really wasn't a crucial game because it was just a regular, regular old game. It wasn't like they had a blowout. It wasn't like they were playing for the playoffs or anything. It was. I, I don't understand. Like, if, even, even if you could put a, put, a little bit of like a like some sort of outside stressor like you said like oh this is for the getting into the playoffs or the wild card or something like you're fighting for this is the final game of the season like okay i get it and and then but you know here's how you do it you just have them butting heads about how to manage the team and it's a general manager and like the head coach like i don't understand why it wasn't just the head coach and the general manager cuz the general manager can be the coach and the GM, I mean, Greg Popovich has been that, I believe, at least he, maybe not anymore, but he was for the San Antonio Spurs forever. I could have seen it being like a Jerry Jones thing where Dean Stockwell would play or James Gregory could play like an owner who is constantly getting his fingers into things. And it's like, I'm just sick and tired of him. I don't care who else buys the team. I'm just sick of him. And whoever buys it is going to be better than him. Or the person has a confederate that wants to buy the team. And so they're killing them and there's two of them. Like there are ways to make this work within the framework of even the, the kind of basic narrative that they gave, but they miss it. They just miss it. And it ends up ends up forcing them to do things that aren't necessarily directly involved with the plot to further the 70 minutes. Cause yes, Valerie Harper and Val Avery and Dean Jagger are great, but like those characters do not jibe with the rest of the episode. And the whole football thing going on. Like, we've had these, like, mil we've had, like, a military episode. We've had, like, the music episode, the, the John Cassavetes one. This could have been the football one. And instead, they were like, nah, the football thing's actually not important other than the title and other than the literal reason one character is murdering another. But they had so many other directions they could have gone with the same group of people and just make it. Or, you know, maybe Valerie Harper plays, like, cheerleader that, we you know, again, like, there's plenty of things to do. It's just they, like, made every wrong choice is what it feels like. Like, after the, the initial setup, they made every wrong choice. We are talking about a football team. And who has guest spots in here? Harold Harrison, Jim McMillan, fucking Pat Riley of Lakers fame, Pat Riley, <laughs> you know, Flynn Robinson. I understand and I read like the behind the scenes as to why these four basketball players are in this episode. Oh, hey, we have this opportunity and let's get these guys in here. But what the fuck, man? This is not a basketball centric episode. You should have had like, I don't know, whoever's playing for who, who who's the, the, the team out there? The 49, not the 49ers, it the been Giants, the Rams. I mean, it's the, the Ra Rams. It's the Ra it was the Rams and it wasn't the Rams. And then it's the Rams again. And they're the they're the Los Angeles Rockets, right? Right. So you know, you get four 
football players to show up at some point, and then you, you play all, you also you make sure that they are in the same shots as Columbo because the sight of little Peter Falk with these huge basketball players is really freaking funny. The sight of little Peter Falk with these huge football players probably would have been even funnier. I don't want to judge the show based on the this premise of this episode alone, but the show really does kind of come down to the premises of each episodes and how engaging they are because they, they are changing every episode. It's always something new. This show is monster of the week show there is no overarching storyline like there would be now if they made the show so you do have to judge each and every one by the the narrative construct that it creates for itself and then it sets columbo inside like a fucking terrarium almost like it's just every time they're just changing something just a little bit more and then setting columbo into it and this time it, it, it like we said it has this opportunity to be Again, like all the rich people that are involved in the sports world. And maybe that is an episode that they do at some point. I mean, do they ever come back to the sports world with Columbo? I mean, I mentioned the chess episode, big time sports there. That guy sticking a butt plug up his butt to vibrate would uh, would agree with us. Oh my God. Yeah, I forgot about that guy. He just really wanted to win at chess, Mike. At all costs maybe in the like reboot the, the the later episodes the abc episodes there were but i really i'm not thinking of anything sports related other than chess when it comes to these early episodes not even like a golf episode there's definitely a, a like a weightlifter there's a guy who really is all about like exercise it just feels like part and parcel with like rich people rich people own Things that people like us can own. I know this is going to shock everybody, but we're not rich. That we, we, can't, we can't own. Again, like, that's my point. Like, Robert Cole can't fucking buy the team, like, any more than I could. Like, and it's, what the fuck, guys? Like, come on, do five minutes worth of research, please. Because I, I, and, you know, you mentioned the Columbo books kind of being all over the place. And I feel like some of it may come down to your ability to overlook the stupidity of the setup. Because if you can overlook kind of how how hinky the setup is, Robert Culp is still fantastic, and he's such a force when he's on like screen opposite Columbo. That again, like I get why they cast him so many times in this show because he's just he's a fantastic in this menacing dickhead rich guy, or I guess businessman role is probably a better way of putting it. And if memory serves, he comes back for a third time. I almost feel like I'm speaking out of turn about that. I now need to look up You're and right. make sure that he was, is he? Okay. Yeah, he plays I, Inspector Brimmer. Uh, Actually, he comes back two more times. It says he has four credits really? on Columbo through oh, 1990. Oh, okay, so he'll come back in like the 89, 90 season. Interesting. Okay. But he wasn't a big pal of Peter Falk, though, right? Yeah, I know for sure which one he was in. Yeah, and we're going to like that. That's season three when he comes back for um double exposure i don't think that he and falk were good friends beforehand but i imagine they got along if he's coming back three times four times and especially to come back like in the later stuff because that was you know more folk controlled the one that was getting me was the plain clothesman who's there when columbo is basically ignoring the the crime scene other than the fresh water and we'll talk about the fresh water in a second here because i know you brought it up already but we need to talk more about it there's the guy who just basically has like one big close-up and he's the guy who's just in a suit and he's just he looks um almost maybe like a little bit native american or something he just like comes up and he's just like hey i'm i'm inspector so-and-so or like whatever his name is and He's another one of Falk's uh, Cassavetti's connections. He uh, was in A Woman Under the Influence and Shadows. So it's just like, oh, okay, just throw this guy a bone because he never comes back. <laughs> I I was wondering about that. They like make a point of introducing him and then like nothing, nothing. He'll be back two more times in Columbo. Oh, I take it back. He was in Blueprint for Murder. The, the one with four Tucker, then he's in this one, and then he'll be back in season five, Identity Crisis. So we, we missed his first appearance. Really made a major impression on us. 
I like that the conversation is about nipple babies and nobody talks about actors who are just like being cast because they're friends with people. But like, I ain't got no problem with it. It just cracks me up because like this show is like replete with that. <laughs> like, just so many of these like random people that are like, hey, you're Peter Falk's pal, right? You want like one sag minimum? <laughs> yeah, because Val Avery, I mean, he's going to come back a ton. And I want to say Dean Stockwell's also going to come back. So he must have gotten along with Falk as well. I'm a fan of anyone who got along with Peter Falk. Because he seems like a hard guy to get along with. <laughs> I just, I love Dean Stockwell so much. I just wish he had more to do in this episode. I mean, you know, come on, Dr. Yui, you know, you can't go wrong with this guy. No, I'm with you. I love Dean Stockwell. He he comes back though, right? So I'm not, I'm he, he cast a, he comes back in a more substantial role. So it's a very young, unnecessary role for Dean Stockwell. They really don't have him do anything. Other than look surprised when Robert Culp shows up to kill him with a giant chunk of ice. And can you see why I was comparing him to Bradford Dillman? They both have that kind of unkempt look about themselves, and they're basically just two useless characters that are just there to be killed. Yeah, no, totally. But at least Bradford Dillman doesn't get killed by a chunk of ice. That is the fucking goofiest thing about this episode is Columbo tasting the water next to the pool. And knowing that it's fresh water. Well, why would he taste it? I know, I know. It's so strange. It's like those cops that do the whole tasting of the cocaine or the heroin, and it's just like, you wouldn't really do that. Like, in real life, cops don't just go up and lick their pinky and stuff it into a bag of white powder and then taste it. I mean, you could just be murdered so easily with what? that. What is it? What is it? What does they say, good fellows? Night, night, asshole. <laughs> That's what I think of, that guy, that fucking tasting the cocaine. Yeah, like, it's, I don't understand. It's so goofy. Like, we, we kind of, we've saved it because it's so good. Like, it's it's the part of the episode where w- we've seen it before, we've talked about it before, and it bears repeating. They have these moments where Columbo acts outside of the reality of the show, and he's like, he knows he's on a show. So he has to do that thing. And it's like, First off, the water wouldn't even be there. It would have been dried already because that's not how water works. <laughs> Secondly, the fact that it's him tasting the water being like fresh water. That's like what That's what the boys in the lab are for. Right. Exactly. But I just I, I don't know. That is just I like like that it was a chunk of ice, but that's about it. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> it's just again the episode makes some wrong turns in some very like key places that just kind of make it feel like maybe a second or third pass like the first draft is is the first draft for a reason not everybody's david foster wallace like oh it's one draft and that's it like eh. not this time guys i mean i can't swear to what john t dugan has done otherwise because he did a lot of tv work i think i'll probably run into him pretty soon because I'm doing a watch, a very slow watch of Kung Fu. And he did like seven episodes of Kung Fu. You know, he did an episode of Star Trek. He did, you know, Mission Impossible. I think he wrote that shark movie, the Sam Fuller shark movie, which is just absolutely bizarre. That's for Reynolds versus a shark, which is pretty good. I would watch that. I would watch that. It's not like he was... A mystery writer is what I'm trying to say. I can't swear, like, maybe his episode of Ben Casey or Mr. Novak, whatever, maybe those were mysteries. I, I'm i unfamiliar with those titles. Like, of course, I know Ben Casey, but, you know, in every episode was, you know, medical related. Maybe there was something there, but it's not like, you know, oh, yeah, this guy's a great mystery writer. We got to have him write these two episodes of this show. And the Star Trek episode that he wrote, Return to Tomorrow, not a good one. A great one. It's okay. I just remember Diana Mulder's in that episode, and that's it. Speaking with, uh, what was the gentleman's name? John Black, I think his name was. He wrote his name. Let me say this. His name was on some Star Trek episodes, but he was telling me that the way that it worked, basically, your name didn't necessarily always line up with your episode, the one that you worked on the most. So it was basically like, put this guy's name someplace and then Ron Barry always had to come in and fuck with everything. So it was like that guy was just like 
And it was the worst experience of my entire writing career was working with Gene Roddenberry. Like, oh, okay. You know, kind of kind of what I figured. You know what they say though? An eccentric knows what he wants and an eccentric gets what he wants. So <laughs> I mean, hey, we have Star Trek. Gene Roddenberry can be as weird as he wants to be and over as overbearing as he wants. And I'm right there still in 2020 fucking three watching Picard, watching Brave New Worlds or Strange New Worlds, watching Discovery. Yeah. And and you know what? I would extend the same response to someone like Peter Falk. He is an actor in the mold of an actor with a capital. He's the kind of actor that like, it's not that I don't think they exist anymore in Hollywood, but I think they do a very good job of keeping the raps on them being pains in the asses. Because I think it negatively affects their image in the public, and I don't think any actor wants to be seen as hard to work with. By directors, that's one thing, but by the public, I think it's different. Peter Falk is obviously the centerpiece of this show, but he was clearly hard to work with, but he clearly also got what he wanted all the time, so... Well, let me just say that, you know, for folks listening, if you don't want to watch this episode, if you haven't seen this episode, just do yourself a favor and watch the final bit of it, because... It is such a master class to see Falk and Culp going against each other. And Falk, when he's doing the whole thing with his finger by his mouth and like pointing upwards and just kind of doing this like nervous tick type thing. And then when he keeps pointing out when Robert Culp will turn down the radio versus turn off the radio. And I love when he turns off the radio. It's like, see, you did it again. You know, you did the same thing the first time I came in here last Sunday. I guess that's what started me wondering. I did what? You turned the radio down, but not quite off. When I told you that Eric Wagner was dead. It's all right. I do the same thing. You know, when I'm listening to a game and my wife interrupts, I can't help myself. I want to hear that game, and I don't care how important the interruption. Your wife has my sympathy. However, when I told you about the fresh water on the decking, when I told you that Eric Wagner might have been murdered, you know what you did? Turn the radio completely off. Well, I thought I struck a chord or something. No, Columbia struck out. Now, would you please go find somebody else to pester? Peter Falk and Robert Culp are so evenly matched as as as, antag- as antagonists towards one another. We always kind of talk about the way these episodes end, and some of them, like Ross Martin episode, right? This is similar to this one, right? Where there there is no coda. Like it ends, and it's like, and I got gotcha. you. The end. Well, they have those like series of back and forth of their close-ups and then cut to that tape player winding out. I'm just like, oh, that's so nice. <laughs> it has a fantastic, like, last 10 minutes. The last 10 minutes are really good because, again, Robert Culp and Peter Falk together in the same scene, they're gonna be fireworks, and there are, and they're really good together. It's just too bad everything else leading up to that doesn't doesn't back that up because that that I wish that the the twist at the end was more earned. It felt more earned because it's a it's a good one, and that scene between the two of them is almost I think might be one of the best back and forths we've seen on this show. The one thing that I really wish had happened in this episode was that little girl who got stiffed for ice cream that she was the one that brought Culp down. It was like <laughs> Mister Mister, and then like I remember that son of a bitch. I, I was actually kind of surprised that she didn't come back because oftentimes they're showing us these things to pay them off at the end. I mean, that little girl was trying to take down uh, Cassavetes. Robert Culp is the ice cream man. It's just, he looks, he's got, he's just looks pretty menacing, even with wearing that goofy little paper hat. So there are glimmers of fun. I think this is a better episode than Greenhouse Juggle. I think it hangs together better. I think it's a more entertaining episode, but I would say it has similar problems. The setup needs to be a lot stronger than this to carry through for the rest of the episode. Hey, Chris, we are in luck. I recently spoke with director Jeremy Kagan all about his 1978 feature film, The Big Fix. And while we were chatting, I asked him a few questions about Columbo. So get ready for hey, it's just a few minutes here, but an interview with Jeremy Kagan all about his time at Columbo. And we'll come back with that right after these brief messages. Could you tell me about shooting the most crucial game? This was, I think, it's the second season of Columbia, or maybe the end of the first. I'm not quite sure which. I, I got this opportunity. It's my third professional job. It, it, one of the things that was sort of bizarre was I. Um, they told us that you had ten days to make these. 
I was the only person in the history of making of this movie, these these movies, the Colombo, that actually did it in 10 days. Because I thought that's all you had. I didn't know you could go over to tell you 10 days to make something you make in 10 days. But one of the things that was fabulous, it was coming from sort of a film school orientation. I designed a whole bunch of shots that the professional filmmakers didn't quite know how to do them. And I'm suggesting, well, because the, like, for example, a dolly shot. And I said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll put a, a, let's, let's, let's get a, just a, um, you know, a, 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 a wheelchair. What? A wheelchair. We'll put you into the camera in the wheelchair and we'll push the wheelchair. I'd never done anything like that before because they had dollies, all these cranes and all the rest. But, you know, when you're in film school, a wheelchair is your dolly if you can move it at all. I still remember the, 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 the guy who was the cameraman, sort of like, just his, his, his face was kind of lighting up because it was all sort of new and fresh. And I also remember how innocent and naive I was. Uh, Peter Falk, who I later became friends with because John Cassavetes became one of my mentors. Peter was having financial issues with the studio. And uh, I didn't know anything about this. And because the show is such a hit, he, I think, wanted more money. Um, and so all of a sudden on day four or five or six, um, he... he isn't coming out of his trailer. And I don't know what's going on. So I go over, knock on the trailer, and say, Peter, are you all right? And Peter opens the door, he looks at me, and he realizes, I have no idea what's going on, that all I care about is making good a film as we could. And this smile creeps on his face, and he says, ah, I'll be in the set in a couple of minutes. And, you know, he was there, you know, just playing, which was, you know, I, I guess... Not knowing the rules and the game and just being caring about, you know, how much fun we can all have and how we can make something good was sort of my attitude toward that. So it was, uh, I mean, I do remember the experience and we did things like you could never do now. I remember uh, there was a moment when it was and then when the, the villain in this character, I decided he was going to get in this ice cream truck and escape. We actually got on a freeway and we sort of stole the shot. You could have never done that now. It's impossible. But now times change. Yeah, Robert Culp, one of the best Columbo villains. And that guy just seeds the whole time. Yeah, what a fabulous guy. And I remember he was reading these books about what would now be called AI stuff. He was totally into sort of the future of technologies. So in between takes, I'd watch him looking at these books that were quite dense about where we were going to head and looks like he was right. Are you part of the casting process or is that already set before you even step on to the, the soundstage? It's a good question. And the process has changed over the years. Obviously, Peter was there. Um, Culp, I'm, I'm pretty sure Universal had already asked him to do it. I don't think I had anything to do with that. But all the other cast, all the other characters in the piece, those were regular casting sessions. And I believe very, very firmly, um, that in fact, the director needs to be the person who is going to sort of make the dis final decisions in terms of who's going to be in the cast. Because the one responsibility the director has that nobody else has on a filmmaking set is to help the actors give the best performances they can give. There's nobody else there. I mean, if you want design, you got great production designers. If you want, you know, terrific editing, you got great editors. You got, you know, great cinematographers. They can hopefully see better and will record the sound better if the sound man than you. But the one thing that you do, and the one responsibility you have, is getting a performance. And so, therefore, casting, which is such an important part of that, should be and often is the responsibility of the director. Things have changed now because casting used to be almost all in person. Now, so many of the pieces that we do um, are cast because someone sends in a tape. But them in person is a, a vital part of, of the process that you need to do. And I remember this particular movie, um, this, is, uh, uh, this is Natty uh, casting this particular girl, uh, Meredith Salinger, who you know, had never done anything before. And, and I remember what was so powerful is the person who ran Disney, because they are the people that actually made that movie. They said uh, in the end there were three actresses, and they were all very good. Um, but I knew which one after we did a screen test, which we did a full screen test, which one of these uh, actresses would be, I think, the best one to play the part. And I didn't have the support of a lot of the junior executive of the studio, and even my producer at the time was like, well, I think maybe we should go for the more classic Disney-looking you know, actress. And I remember the studio 
executive said, who do you want? And I said, I want Meredith Salinger. This is the person I think will give the best performance. And I remember the studio executive said, well, you're responsible for getting the best performance. And if that's the actress you want, that's the actress we'll use. Quite exceptional, actually. That's, that's a really positive story, of which I'm sure there are lots of other directors who can tell you just the opposite. I've always wondered because uh, Val Avery shows up in the episode that you directed. And that's pure because I knew Val through John Cassidy. Oh, okay. Because I know like he shows up in a bunch of Columbo episodes, and I wasn't sure if that was just like kind of, hey, do me a favor or what it was. John had his own sort of body of actors that worked with him, is it? and um, you know, besides Benny Gav and Gazzara and, and obviously Peter Falk. And Val Avery was one of them. In fact, I used in my first feature, I used Val um, in that, and I used him in another movie as well. A number of other actors that John had used, because John worked with great actors. And so, um, I was lucky enough to know them and meet them. And you know, these are oftentimes parts that the studio isn't concerned with, because um, they're concerned with what, how they're going to advertise something. These are, you know, these are not the characters that are, people are going to go to see the movie. Yeah, I remember Val had a fabulous language of his own, and I remember at one time he said some line I heard him say, and I immediately put it in 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 the, the, the first feature I did, Heroes, where he said, you know, something like, I'm going to eat your liver. And I said, well, okay, God. I think I'm going to use that line. That's a good one. Also, uh, Robert Culp got to kill a very young Dean Stockwell in that uh, movie as well. Oh, right, the opening opening sequence i was actually just thinking about about that because at, at this columbo ran a, a week ago or two weeks ago and i accidentally saw that it was running and i look at that opening sequence and think ah, i want to shoot it in, a, in another way was valerie harper was she already a no quantity at that point when you had her as the the prostitute uh, no she was a you know one of the working actors and it's so uh, kind of fascinating because I don't think either of us remembered when I directed her in um, Golda's Balcony, which she was this one woman show that she did such an amazing job. And then uh, the film version of it, which I think is actually, actually quite good, but she's fabulous. Um, but we didn't remember working together. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that happens. Well, Chris, next episode, Columbo goes to the UK. Ba, 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 Wow, we're already here? Like, he's already traveling overseas? Man, this show must have been immensely popular. Oh, wait, it was. Oh, oh wait, it was. Yes, we were talking about Dagger of the Mind, so we're going to have a lot of, what is that, Macbeth references, the Scottish play. We can't talk about it. Apparently, it's okay to talk about it on podcasts, but if we were in the theater right now, we'd be prepared for, you know, some bad times. Ian McKellen does not mention the name of that. I won't say it. So like, okay, whatever. I mean, I get it. The superstition is superstition, but we can say it. You're right. But until then, Chris, what is happening in your world, sir? The same thing that's always happening, trying to take over the world. Through the way of your audio repositories, known as your ears. I guess there's a subpar. Weirdingwaymedia.com is where you can go to hear all the things that I work on and uh, all the other cool folks over there. 80s TV ladies, film entries, Twisted and Uncorked. The list could go on and I could go on, but I'm not going to because I'm going to kick it to Mike and ask him, where could people find you when you're not here hosting this show? Guess what? Same place, weirdingwaymedia.com. That's the place where you can go to find all these other shows that we work on. You got your Barney Miller. You got your Night Gallery. We still have some episodes out there of Dreams for Sale, the Twilight Zone 85 podcast. That's still rolling along, which is fantastic. And then, yeah, you got us talking about Columbo here every month. If you just happen to stumble onto this episode, going back listen to the previous ones we've got some interviews we might have some interviews coming up here pretty soon as well so some good times and until then i want to encourage people to go on over to wherever they download this from and give us a little rating review maybe share it with your friends put on one of those many 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 columbo groups over on facebook we'd love to get the word out who would they cast as Columbo now? I don't. They're not asking that all the time. Those are our friends over at the Cold Jack Facebook. 
The Cold Jack Facebook page ended up being a lot more entertaining for the wrong reasons. The Colombo people are a lot more chill. I appreciate that. Yeah, and they're they're not even picking up on Poker Face, which I'm really surprised that they haven't either started to rip that one apart or said, oh, wow, Natasha Leone is doing what Mike and Chris said all those months ago, and she's basically playing Columbo. Yeah, I uh, I haven't personally watched it yet, but I have heard nothing but good things, which bodes well for more of it. So, hey, there need to be more female detective shows out there because it's been a space more or less dominated by men in the medium of TV of this era, that they're kind of doing their own version of this era of the detective things. So right on, man. Yeah, watch watch that show. I've heard good things. It's really good. And by the way, the Orpheus Syndrome, which is the eighth episode of the first season, there are so many Columboisms. I mean, she is really falcon it up in there. Ah, oh, gosh, I, I'm sorry. You know what? I feel really intrusive here. Maybe I shouldn't have come. Highly recommended if you like the one and only Columbo. He's got, there's a new player in town, folks. And if you, you've got to like Columbo. That's why you're here. 